Something like 10.2 million Americans have angina, and among symptomatic patients without previous known CAD who are referred for catheterization, most have non-obstructive CAD and a sizable share have normal coronary arteries described as less than 20% diameter stenosis. In the September issue of Jack Interventions, they have a series of papers taking a look at coronary physiology, and one of the more interesting ones is effect of sex differences on invasive measures of coronary microvascular dysfunction in patients with angina in the absence of obstructive coronary artery disease. So I would like to introduce you to uh, one of the co-authors, Jennifer Tremel, who is an MD and assistant professor of medicine at Stanford University Medical Center. First, why did you do this study? It's very interesting. Why did you do it, set out and do it in the first place? Yeah, so so the larger study, it's very important because most of the data that we have in looking at patients who have chest pain and normal coronary arteries uh, is in those is in women, uh, and people don't really know about the men. And while women are far more common to have this, um, it's about two thirds. There are at least you know a third of men will come in with chest pain and normal coronaries as well. And we learned a lot from the Y study, um, which was an all women study uh, that's saying you know a lot of these patients have microvascular dysfunction, they have endothelial dysfunction, but from that kind of became this, oh, women are more likely to have microvascular dysfunction. Um, and, and perhaps because they're presenting this way, more commonly they do. But one of my questions is really, is there a sex difference, right? In those that come in with chest pain and normal coronaries, are women actually more likely to have microvascular dysfunction? Um, or is it the same between men and women? So that was really the background um, of the larger study. Um, this particular uh, publication focused on measuring microvascular dysfunction. And uh, the way we did it is we used a coronary pressure wire. And so we were using thermodilution uh, as the method of measuring microvascular dysfunction. Traditionally, people have used uh, CFR with a, uh, with a Doppler flow wire. And uh, that's how WISE did it. Um, and many studies have looked at it that way. Um, with the coronary pressure wire, we were actually able to get CFR as well as IMR. Um, and IMR is the index of microvascular resistance, and it just uses hyperemic um, parameters, and it really is um, simply focusing on the microvasculature, and so we actually think it's a more accurate measure of microvascular dysfunction than CFR, potentially. Um, and so we had the opportunity here to look at that and look at it from a sex difference perspective. So how many did you look at and exactly what did you find? Yeah, so this, uh, that publication had about 160 patients total, uh, 40 of them men. Um, at this point, we've looked at about 200. Uh, and really, uh, the biggest finding was that CFR was lower in women um, than in men. Um, but there was no difference in IMR, um, which again is as this index that we think is really um, focusing on the microvasculature. It suggests that there isn't um, a sex difference in microvascular dysfunction, um, but there is this difference again with CFR. And so, you know, we went beyond that. Um, and I do want to credit uh, my, one of my postdocs, um, Yuhei Kobayashi, who's the uh, Senior, or I'm the senior author. He's the lead author on this paper, um, and uh, you know, so he looked at this in more detail. And what we found is that it was resting flow um, that was actually different between the sexes, um, whereas it wasn't necessarily um, a focus on the microvasculature at all. At this point, what are the clinical implications? So I think um, based on what we found, um, CFR may not be the best measure uh, for microvascular dysfunction in women in particular. So in men, we didn't see this difference with CFR, but women had higher resting flow. Um, and because of this difference in resting flow, it ultimately affected um, the CFR value that we saw. And so it may be that if you do CFR in women, you're gonna get this artificially low number and say, oh, you have microvascular dysfunction when in, case, when in fact they may not. Any theories as to why you found what you found? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we're kind of left with is why do women have, um, you know, this higher resting flow? Um, and the other thing is that CFR really, there's a lot of data um, showing that it has prognostic importance. Uh, so we can't disregard that, right? There's a, a lot of past data. Um, so I think one of the questions is if CFR is actually lower just because of this resting flow and it's and not necessarily because of microvascular dysfunction um, you know is there something about 
the resting flow that we see in these patients and maybe something about their vascular tone, um, and that means something, I'm not sure, but low CFR is associated with uh, you know, worse future events. Uh, and so what is it about it specifically? So, I mean, the nice thing about this is um, I think it looks at sex differences. It looks at these two modalities. Um, this wasn't designed to necessarily say which one's better, but we do at least see this difference. And so I think it opens the doors um, for other investigators and, and ourselves as well to come in and say, okay, what are we, what's really going on here? Um, and ultimately, which one is the best test? What are we, what are we measuring? Um, we have a lot to learn still. So you're continuing it, and you've got another paper that's going to be coming out, but you're continuing along these lines to try and determine what else is happening? Yeah, so yeah, what else is, what are we actually measuring um, and, and what is the implication of that? So these women and men uh, that we've been studying will also be following uh, for you know, years to come. Um, and it will be interesting to see, do we see any differences with IMR in terms of the prognostic um, you know, implications of that? Uh, is there anything about this resting flow uh, that means something in the future? Well, in their accompanying commentary, Alexandra Lansky and Cody Pietras wrote, in their elegant study, the emphasis on microvascular dysfunction as the primary cause of the sex differences in angina symptoms in the absence of obstructive CAD may have been misguided. Yeah. Would you well, agree with that? Um, I think this is a chance for us to kind of step back um, and maybe get out of our assumptions a little bit and say what's really going on here. So the mo more people that look at this, I think um, the better, uh, and the more we'll learn about uh, both women and men who have chest pain and normal coronaries. Well, Dr. Trimble and her team's uh, work is in Jack Interventions. It is the September issue. Please take a look at that. And around here at TCT, we have a lot of coverage, so please see that in Cardiosource World News. I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.